As always, before we begin this video, I'd like to verbally thank my patrons, especially those donating $10 or more monthly, such as Alexander Wood, CeeLo, Anatoly Volnov, Andrew Melnick, Silver Silence, Wolf HD, Young Master Pig, Missing a Tile, Darius Fazier, Almost Dead Again, James Phillips, Vladimir's Noldholm, Colin Gajic, Jano, JW, Big Time Jim, Fralem, Mixer Rules, Duncan Bristow, Cooper Sutton, Fockhead, Money and Muses, Corbet Godwin, JP De La Torre, and John Strange. This week's video is the first one where I've gotten to use this new microphone, which I was only able to get thanks to the patrons, so while I'm still learning the nuances of using a condenser microphone effectively, it should already sound at least a bit better than it did before, and it'll only get better from here. Thanks. Despite how it may look, there's a huge difference between limbo and inside. So, I just finished playing through Playdead's ludography, Limbo and Inside, and I originally thought I was going to do a video about the merits of semi-abstract art, specifically games, and why it can be really cool. Things were going well when I finished Limbo, I had a really good angle to talk about the game, now I just needed to play through another semi-abstract game by the same man in the same studio, Inside. The only issue was that Inside wasn't abstract at all, at least not in the same way, both games, however, are fantastic examples of the merits of their motifs, so let's talk about them. We'll go over Limbo first, so I can explain what I mean by semi-abstract, and I can more easily explain how Inside isn't that. I knew going in that Limbo was going to be a pretty abstract game. I remembered that there was no dialogue, no real narrative, just boatloads of visual symbolism. So as soon as I started the game out, I was prepared to start grasping at straws. I had seen nothing but trees, ropes, and bear traps at this point, but already I was trying to develop a sort of thesis, a lens to view this game through. There was one particular moment where I fell right into a cleverly laid trap by the game, and I thought to myself, this game is punishing me for being overly ambitious and playing with so much unjustified confidence. I'm sure this is more of a reflection of myself than anything the game was going for, but we'll get to why that's a good thing in a moment. There was no losing it at this point. I had had that initial thought about ambition, and that was now how I was going to see the rest of the game. The game was no longer about whatever was going through Arndt Jensen's mind when he was making the game. The game was now about me and this idea that I had attached to it. Well, moving forward, as in through the rest of the game, I realized that things weren't quite as abstract as my 11-year-old self thought. We were going through a portrayal of human history. First, we are alone in the woods, fighting monsters, then we get shot at by some tribals with blowguns, then we see an aqueduct, followed by hotels, factories, advanced technologies, etc., until eventually we end up outside in the woods again. I'm sure that since I went ahead and planted that idea about ambition in your head, you can already see where I'm going with this. Limbo is, to me, about how mankind tried and failed to transcend itself, and our tireless motivation to think up new hurdles to overcome. No matter how advanced the society we find ourselves in gets, the boy is never in any less danger. These fantastically advanced factories and modern hotels are all just as dangerous, and sometimes even more so, than the monsters in the woods that this was all meant to be an escape from. Hell, they even throw in a girl as a 50% universally relatable object of desire. And before you call me sexist or something, I say that she's an object of desire simply because of this scene when we see her, we think that the game is about to end, only to find that she's been replaced with more of these cold, loveless tunnels of machinery by the time we get back to her. Anyways, this idea of some trophy woman waiting at the end of our journey seems sort of underwhelming for a game like this. However, through this lens of ambition, she starts to make perfect sense as a plot device. Seeing as she isn't a character in this game, but an object, it's easy to project anything in the world onto her. Maybe she's a girl you've been wanting to ask out, maybe she represents mankind's endless pursuit of seemingly unattainable goals. That's what's so cool about abstract and semi-abstract art. As I said earlier, it isn't about the artist as much as it is about you. Sure, I've argued before that this is true for all art, and I do absolutely still believe that, but think back to what I said at the beginning of this segment about Limbo. In the first 10 minutes of the game, I was already projecting my own ideas onto it. I wasn't thinking about who this boy was, or how he ended up in this situation, or where his parents were, or anything like that. I wasn't thinking at all about what this literally was, I was thinking about what it all metaphorically meant to me, and that's where we get to Inside. Inside started out totally different for me than Limbo did. While Limbo started with me getting really damn speculative about the ludothematic intent behind basic platforming puzzles, Inside started with me thinking about the story. I'm a small boy who's clearly sneaking around in some place he isn't supposed to be. If I get caught, I'm in big danger. Where am I breaking into? What am I after? Is it some family member that was captured by this shadowy organization? Am I on the run from the law? 
In Limbo's first few minutes, anything was possible and everything was a mystery. In Inside's first few minutes, anything was possible so long as it involved me hiding from the authorities, and why I was hiding was the only mystery. Now, before I start giving the wrong impression, Inside, like Limbo, is absolutely filled to the brim with symbolism, metaphors, and all of that good stuff. We'll be getting to my take on all of that in a moment, but for now, I just want to drive home how different the thought process is when analyzing something like Limbo versus something like Inside. In the former, I'm asking myself what this means to me, and in the latter, I'm asking myself what this means, period. Both are compelling, but in totally different ways. Well, as we move forward, more and more light is shed. We're breaking into this weird dystopian town where the powers that be have transformed a whole lot of the population into mindless slaves to be put in cages and sold like meat. We start off with a good old secret laboratory hidden underneath an inconspicuous barn and slowly work our way into the town, where we have to evade various security measures until we eventually break into a much more conspicuous lab, find out about all sorts of genetic experiments done to other humans, and then turn their experiments against the staff. That answers most of the literal questions about the game. While fittingly simple, it's a real story unlike the vague series of symbols and metaphors in Limbo. Therefore, over the course of the game, I'm asking myself questions about that story, and I save the poetic interpretive stuff for after I'm finished, whereas in Limbo, the poetic interpretive stuff is at the front of my mind from beginning to end. In the first few moments of Limbo, I had already formed an abstract thesis that I carried through the rest of the game. You'll have formed a different thesis, and the guy after you a different one still. And whatever that thesis is, you'll carry it with you through the game just as I did mine, and hopefully you'll learn something about yourself in the process. I had a whole game's worth of symbols and metaphors to interpret with absolutely no narrative baggage to slim down my understanding of the game to something more precise but not quite as personal to me. With Inside, however, I had a whole ass narrative to interpret and then figure out how all of the metaphors and stuff could play into my interpretation. Simply put, analyzing one plays out in the opposite order to the other. They're both very cool for very different reasons. You're about to see that my analysis of the abstract limbo is much simpler than my analysis of the less abstract inside. That's sort of how it goes with abstract art. You can think of it like this. The more abstract it is, the more complicated your thoughts with it are, but the less words it takes to describe those thoughts. The less abstract it is, the less complicated your thoughts, but the more complicated your explanation of those thoughts. I hate that I'm so compelled to use a graphic for this, but hey, might as well take advantage of my medium. Hopefully I've already done a good enough job at explaining the merits of these two styles, because it's time to look at inside, and I can't have anything else getting in the way of this really intricate metaphor I found throughout the game. To me, inside represents how society treats its subjects. I'm sure that we could all figure that much out, it's not like this is a very subtle metaphor. But remember how I said that Limbo takes you through a timeline of human history? Well, to me, inside takes you through a timeline of a single person's history. Think of it as the dark side of the moon to Limbo's amused to death. Here's how I see it. You start out as a child, playing with some baby chicks, being scared by a boar and some mean dogs, that sort of stuff, and before long you're in school, having to learn to fit in with society. This whole section of the game gives me a big Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 vibes, which of course is a song about Pink feeling like he was being indoctrinated by the school system. We're forced to walk in perfect sync with all of these mind-controlled zombies pretending to be one of them. Of course, in reality, all of your classmates probably felt this way too, but we're still a kid at this point, and part of being a kid is having main character syndrome. That is to say, thinking that you're the only one who gets it. The only one that isn't a sheep. As far as we're concerned, we're the only ones who know how to evade the security cameras. The metaphor of this game will take us through the realization that that isn't the case soon enough, so bear with me as I adopt the perspective of a high school student for a bit longer. After graduating, we try to hide from the system for a bit longer, maybe we're trying to become a musician, a painter, or hey, a YouTuber, but eventually we have to stop hiding from the system and get a real job. Maybe getting a real job is the best way to go unnoticed as the radical, unique mind that this world of ours surely wants to grind smooth. Yeah, this is just another stage of being undercover, being different, not being a sheep. We'll go for a job as a submariner, that'll keep the government off our backs. Well, that it does. We don't face any danger from the authorities at this point. However, there's another danger. That nagging voice in the back of our mind telling us that we're becoming a sheep. The sirens. That's what I'm going to call these underwater enemies. As their actions a bit later in the game indicate, they're actually not sheep. They aren't one of them. They're unique humans trying to find their individuality amongst the system just like we are. For now, however, we're just jealous of them. They don't need a job as a submariner to stay away from the government, they could just swim and swim all day, reminding us of the freedom that we just gave away. In fact, the metaphor stands up to another level of scrutiny. 
If these sirens represent, let's say, post-high school art students who still haven't gotten a job, then it makes sense that the light that comes off of our career scares them away. They don't want to be like us, they want to make us one of them, much like we did during the school section. I know that I'm going really far with this metaphor right now to the point where I've probably already shown a link chart a couple of times, but stick with me because just like the game itself, this is all leading up to something really cool. Eventually, we start to see how we're becoming a part of the system, visualized by showing all of these zombies who at one point probably felt a lot more like individuals, and the truth is beating at us like these pulses that rip our character apart if we're caught in their blast. All of these people who I've considered sheep my whole life are individuals just like me. I guess I should explore myself some more so that I don't suffer the same fate as they did. Well, that's where the chain we're climbing up to our next day of work breaks, and we get taken by one of those art students we used to be so jealous of. Well, they make us one of them alright. Literally, the siren gives us an augmentation that allows us to breathe underwater and experience the same freedom that they do. They were on our side the entire time. They wanted to show us how bullshit the 9 to 5 grind is, and with their act of kindness, we realize indisputably that we aren't alone. All those kids you went to school with, all your co-workers, they weren't sheep. They were just doing what they had to do to survive, just like you were. Well, this revelation doesn't mean we get to just quit our job. We enjoy the freedom of being able to breathe underwater and swim to our heart's content for a while, but eventually it's time to get back to work. With this new perspective that the art students, the sirens, have given to us, it gets a little harder to ignore just how the system is trying to break you down. These poor people suspended in the water like corpses, supposedly powering some sort of machine, they were trying to blend in and survive too, but eventually their role in their world got a bit too demanding and here they are. No free will whatsoever, no chance of ever being free to express themselves again. We need to get out of this system before the same thing happens to us. We can't just sit by and wait to be hung up powering some machine for the rest of our lives. It's time to get angry. Well, by this point, it isn't much longer until we're an old man. We've been so warped by the system that we're practically their own little plaything, just swimming around naked to their amusement. Then, moments later, we see what ultimately becomes of their little worker bees. They all get fed to this ball of human trash, and now that we're so fed up with the system, we're fed to it as well. We aren't going down without a fight, though. We're going to tear up this office space, knock down walls, and even kill the head of whatever this horrible facility is in universe. Back to the metaphor, this is like writing a very angry letter of resignation before never showing up to work again. Well, what happens when an old man does that? The system throws him out like trash. Over the final course of this finale, some of the employees of this place very kindly help us to escape, only for us to eventually realize that it's all been an elaborate trap. Well, it isn't much longer until we roll out onto this beach and the game ends. That would all be, well, fantastic on its own, but there's one more thing left to cover before we get to the conclusion. Shortly after being absorbed by the ball of human trash, we land in this diorama. Recognize it? It's the exact same beach. I haven't watched any of the theory videos that surely exist about this game, but to me, there can be no in-universe explanation for this. So for a brief moment, this metaphor I've been tracking throughout the whole game merges with the literal narrative. We die on this beach, supposedly, and the fact that this was apparently planned out by the people in the laboratory can only mean that that angry letter of resignation we left on our boss's desk was all a part of the plan, and dying on the beach, well, that's the retirement plan we've been given. We've outlived our usefulness to the system, and this diorama shows what happens to people like that. We work and we work and we work until we can barely remember what it's all for, and when we realize that we've given our whole life to the system that doesn't care for us one bit, we're thrown onto the garbage heap to die. They've so warped us, they've so tried to make us complacent, they've shown us that to them, we're nothing more than another body to feed to what they see as this hideous pile of human trash. But throughout it all, from school to work to our angry letter of resignation, we never once truly forgot about that individual that we still manage to see ourselves as. All they can do is attach labels to you. They can try to make you believe that you're nothing but another gear in the machine. They can try to make you think that you've become what you always hated, but you haven't truly become that. Because no matter how hideous a worker bee you might look like to everyone else, they were never able to change what's inside.